This week's episode of the SGGQA podcast is brought to you by Frame It. You've just shot a great piece of video, but now you need to frame it. Phones are crazy powerful options for video editing, but a lot of our editing apps still try to work like desktop video software. Frame It gives you streamlined tools to do more advanced edits, but with controls that are a better fit for your phone screen. Use the actions you're already familiar with, like pinch to zoom and rotate, just like you're editing a photo, but with video. Pan, zoom, rotate, and crop as easily as scanning your photo gallery. Time your pan and movements to music, punch in for dramatic effect, flip through a transition, or fix a video for the right orientation. Load up a video and frame it will record your edits and moves in real time. Trim out parts of a clip you don't need and the app renders out all of your edits as a finished clip. Fast, easy, powerful. Frame it is free and available now on Google Play. Your video's not really done, until you frame it. For more info on frame it and tutorials on how to get the best edits out of your phone camera, head on over to frameitapp.com. Once again, frameitapp.com. I want to thank Frame It for supporting the SGGQA podcast. And now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of the SGGQA. And we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions. Welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly, horribly named, horrifically named podcast series. But of course, the QA is the important part, the question and answer. We like to make this an interactive conversation. We like to sort out our feels as... As uh, you know, tech news is is happening throughout the week, and it's why I like to hold my show on a Monday, so that we can sort of sort out those feelings, follow up on news stories as they evolve, and keep an eye on all those topics as they go down. Happy Memorial Day, everybody! I, the, you know, if you're of the United States persuasion, um, I, I really hope that you're getting to spend some time, maybe uh, just taking taking an afternoon off. <laughs> we've we've kind of earned it after the last year that we've been through. Um, but getting to, uh, for me, it's always getting to share some food with some family and, and get, get to kind of hang out and, um, and, and, and kind of reflect. Again, Memorial Day is very aptly named. Um, I come from a military family. My dad's a uh, retired Air Force. And, uh, you know, we, we want to consider uh, those that have um, contributed to the 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 national security the the safety and the privileges and the comfort that we enjoy here in the United States. So uh, for for those of you here in the USA, I, I hope you're having a lovely three day weekend. I, I hope you are getting some time off, and I hope you're getting to spend that time, you know, getting getting to some good food. <laughs> Already seeing a phenomenal, just an amazing group uh, in the live chat already. TK Bay, everybody say hey to TK. We we had another wonderful stream. Uh, if you want the sneak peek on Gadget Lab Four, we actually did a walk around um, on the best of our week, uh, the live stream with TK. But I'm seeing uh, Snorkel, I'm seeing All Greg, Hakey, RF, uh, Gary the Fireman, Gabaletta, um, Simon says Hypno, Vazikos. Otaku, everyone drop an F in the chat for Dave Burns because he's going to have to go back to the office soon. So he's not going to be able to join the live chat anymore. I think we're all going to be sad about that. We got Ranesh. We got a real good crew. Andy, what's up? I agree, Andy. I hope everyone in the U.S. gets to have a relaxing day off. I just feel like when it comes to these types of of uh uh, uh, celeb celebratory days, um, days of remembrance, days of celebration, days of recognition. Um, I, I you know, like, especially lately, just getting to them. Like, congratulations, you you've made it this far. Take a day off and and grill some hot dogs, or we're gonna do some bratwurst. You know, I just bought fancy sauerkraut. It's it's gonna be it's it's nothing super fancy, but it's gonna be fun. Um, Gary the Fireman already jumping in with some tier one subs, uh, hooking up Gabaletta and Snorkel Bill H. Uh, again, thank you so much for supporting the production, man. Gary, you've had my back uh, throughout these streams, and, and I really do appreciate um, the help, the shout outs, the support. Uh, we're, we're, uh, 
we're, we're, we're making big life transitions. And uh, a part of that is also just this crew, you know, being able to be a part of this community and, and, and hook up these, uh, these conversations is, is pretty huge. And RF Daseyev, uh, you, you might need to phonetically spell out how you want me to say your name. And I apologize, RF, RFD, until you tell me who you be. <laughs> Gifting a, til, a tier one sub to Tell Hunter. That's awesome. Thank you so much. We've got we've got we've got a crew, you know, putting together uh, subs here. This is this is fantastic. I really love it. This is this is amazing. Um I've I've put out a couple pitches on Fiverr cuz I'm <laughs> cuz I'm broke. Um I put out a couple pitches on Fiverr for um putting together just a few more Twitch elements so that like when something like that happens and you guys are being amazing and, and gifting out subs we can have like little fanfares and maybe some graphics that can kind of pop out i'm so bad at twitch i'm <laughs> really bad at twitch man um this is this is uh, just keeping up with you guys is is uh definitely keeping me on my toes so uh yes uh we're, we're still in the middle of life transitioning uh moving from the old place to the new place we're almost fully moved in here and moved out there um today is actually the day we're gonna go drive over our keys and garage uh, a parking lot the gate clickers you know all that stuff and finally be done with uh with our old place where gadget lab 3 was and uh, we, we might take Lex to go swimming in their pool one more time <laughs> before we finally walk all the way. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. And, um, I, you know, again, I, I've been sharing some of these, like, complicated emotions and complicated feels. You know, we, we spent a year in quarantine in that place. And so there's a part of us where it's just we're so glad to be out. We're, we're really happy to be in this new place, but we're also, you know, we were in that last home for a year under very, uh, very emotional circumstances. So there are a lot of feels kind of moving back and forth. And um, this is this is going to be just sort of the, the recovery, uh, the, the the therapy sessions that we're going to be going through over the next several years just to kind of get our minds back into what the new normal is going to look like and, and how we're all going to function. So I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to have some people here to chat this out with. I promise I won't abuse our patient therapist relationship <laughs> moving forward. Uh, Fat Produce, uh, greetings. Gadget Lab 4 and your new chair looks kick ass. Um, it's pretty it's pretty nice. I finally got rid of the gaming chair. That was also another one of one of my goals in moving from Gadget Lab Three to Gadget Lab Four. Um, it, it's nothing fancy. It's just one of the sort of base model mesh. Um, but let me tell you, I kind of like having mesh under my bottom. Um, it's really nice having a gaming chair, and especially when the, when this room gets hot, the sun just hits directly on this wall. Um, let, let me tell you, having a gaming chair got real humid. Um, not, not, not super, not, not super nice. Um, did, did not enjoy, uh, especially parts of my biology responsible for sitting and sort of stewing. Uh, I, I don't get gaming chairs that insulate <laughs> the human body. Simon says it. No, one has a meshy bottom. <laughs> I agree, Andrew. Mesh is the best. When I had a leather chair, I always felt like I was sitting in a swamp of my own moisture. Yeah, yeah, gaming chairs. I I do not. I having spent having spent that year, um, almost two years with that gaming chair. There were some things that were actually kind of cool, like how adjustable it was, but was not comfortable. Um, uh, Al Spockley saying air conditioning. We do. Um, but when you live in Southern California, your air conditioner can only do so much in combating the sun. I don't know if you know this, but the sun is a ridiculously powerful source of energy. And <laughs> we, we can only fight it so hard. Um, uh, the combination of blinds, blackout curtains, ACs, unfortunately over on the other side of this room, um, it does okay. It doesn't do great. So why don't we um we we have a proper show? I have a lineup, like actual news and stuff. And and again, always always happy to take some requests or if there are topics that you all want to talk about. 
Um, but we've got some Samsung news to cover. I'm, I'm tentatively interested in one of the more recent Qualcomm Microsoft announcements coming up. Uh, right to repair. We've got... Uh, uh, what I'm, I'm missing stuff my, my my chart is over here and then also I, I wanted to talk through my first weekend using the Xiaomi Mi 11i which is also rebranded from one of the Redmi phones uh, internationally they're the same was it the K40 Pro or Pro K40 or Pro 40k uh, it's alphabet soup with Xiaomi and all of their various brands but surprisingly great upper mid-ranger lower tier premium phone it's good so let's let's jump in uh we've got stuff to talk about and i'm excited <laughs> andy the sun a power source the oil companies have kept this very quiet i i have to imagine that was the sort of tone that you were speaking with why well, I, I don't believe i've heard anything about this I'm not going to turn this into a showcase for my terrible animation voices. I'm not going to do I might do that. So, uh, <laughs> jumping right in. This last week has been slow for getting things out. Um, I'm, I'm shooting ahead on a couple projects, which are going to be really cool. I've got a, a headphone uh, video coming out that's more in keeping with the 2020 hearing videos, um, especially talking about, like, sort of our biology and how that pertains to earbuds, especially if you've got smaller ear canals. But I did manage to get one last video out from Gadget Lab 3. I don't think this is the exact last video that I shot from Gadget Lab 3, but it's one of the last. And I spent a little time with the Samsung Q9U. Now, I got to do the disclosure bit because I actually did quite a bit of work for Samsung a couple years back. Um, years ago, I did a review of one of their little mini micro travel mics, and they thought it was a cool uh, look at one of their products. And so they brought me on to do some of their promo video work. So if you go to the Samsung website for the, um, some of their wireless mics, um, uh, for Q2U, uh, their handheld uh, dynamic um, uh, microphone. I did I did a promo video for that. And also, I think there's satellite. But anyway, a, a couple different mics. This is their uh, sort of broadcast-style hybrid mic. So it's an XLR or a USB connector. It looks a lot like um, microphones that you see in radio stations. Uh, if you've ever seen like an SM7B, this is a mic that's built to kind of compete in that sort of arena. And so, of course, because I'm an old audio nerd and uh, a lot of uh, experience in voice recording, like my, my background is in commercial voiceover, I have a lot of thoughts on how hard people work to copy the sound of more expensive mics when that's probably not really worth their time or effort. And so I've seen a bunch of, you know, like when it comes to these types of hybrid broadcast, oh, is this going to kill the SM7? Is this an SM7B killer? Can, can you kill the most popular broadcast mic of all time with a cheap USB mic? It's not cheap. It's inexpensive. Um, and I just think that's silly. I, I don't really feel like people are really getting what they pay for and the amount of effort it takes to like, well, I'm going to run this through this kind of compressor and then I'm going to do this type of EQ modeling and I'm going to change up this type of filtering. N no, if, if you want an SM7B, you go and get an SM7B. Um, so <laughs> it's a... Uh, Instead, if you want to hear what just a warm, rich broadcast sound is going to sound like for around 200 bucks, um, I think Samson has a pretty solid take on a broadcast mic there. And following up audio, I'm finally getting back on track. I've been way behind on these Patreon videos, but um, I, I had all the samples recorded. All of the samples are in Gadget Lab 3. I haven't completed my setup for recording audio snippets in Gadget Lab 4. So I was really glad that I shot ahead. So I've got three phones, three phones coming out with audio reviews. These are the audio deep dives. OnePlus 9 Pro audio review, surprisingly complete. Uh, taking a look at the speaker tech, um, how it kind of, <clears throat> how it might compare against uh, a Galaxy S21. And, and again, in, in subtle ways, like, What's kind of fascinating is it, our, our phone speakers are getting so good that some of those little nuances kind of matter. Like 
the tuning on a Sony is different than the tuning on a Samsung. And there are reasons. Like, I, I think I can feel out what some of those reasons might be. So comparing more all-rounder products like Galaxy S21s versus OnePlus 9s, I think there's something interesting kind of playing where, you know, one phone might get a little louder, but another phone actually might have slightly better low mids. You know, again, like there are some phones where I feel the experience really is an in the hand kind of arms distance from your face uh, kind of experience. And then there are some phones where they do a reasonably good job of replacing cheap Bluetooth speakers. You know, um, <laughs> I mean, the OnePlus 9 Pro, just to spoil some of the speaker testing, uh, the speakers on the OnePlus 9 Pro do a pretty good job of shaming the speakers on cheap laptops or like on my, my laptop docks, you know, that U-Perfect, the speakers on the U-Perfect are super weak, but this OnePlus 9 Pro is just destroying, <laughs> just shaming, um, something that should have the ability to put in nicer speakers because you've got all that extra real estate, all that extra space. So um, taking a listen to the speaker tech, and then also there's a fun little add-on, or I guess I should say it's an addition that they haven't gotten rid of for headphone tech, where OnePlus is still supporting either USB or uh, passive audio pass-through dongles. So we can still look at the audio quality of the DAC that's built into that phone. Um, Samsung went out of their way to remove any kind of passive audio or uh, audio dongle support. You have to get a USB-C dongle if you want cabled audio, and the OnePlus is still putting out an audio signal. So I just thought that was a nice little add-on. <laughs> Fat Produce, oh, heck yeah, the OnePlus 9 Pro. <laughs> so there are gonna be a few more. Um, hopefully uh, coming in a couple days, I, like I said, I'm way behind. I have to send the phone back, but um, I also have the Black Shark. So we can take kind of a listen to how the tuning is different on a gaming focused phone where I really feel there's a, Xiaomi is making a, an effort at tuning for video gameplay and for watching movies, which is different than if you were mostly consuming music and podcasts. And I feel like that can help contribute to a purchasing decision. Like, I feel like that, that, that kind of helps inform, um, where someone might want to spend their money. Like if you're mostly watching action films on your phone, some speakers are better than for that than others. So uh, yeah, uh, we're gonna have a few more out on the Patreon coming up soon. Um, it, it's uh, you know it's my love and my passion, but throughout this whole last month of trying to get ready for the move, um, it was really difficult shooting audio samples in a house that was chaotically being packed, <laughs> you know, like just carving out the 10 minutes to shoot like quiet audio so I could get all that stuff put together. Um, surprisingly difficult um, putting, putting packing on hold for 10 minutes so I could set up a camera, record clean audio samples. Of course, something would happen like right out the window and I'd have to like either reset or just deal with hearing a clink uh, um, in the background of that audio. It was, it was really rough. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's silly, but we don't have to mess with that anymore. Um, from Barry Johnson, definitely curious to hear the different tuning on a standard phone versus a gaming phone. Um, and from all Greg, I, I, all Greg said, I could just call him Greg. Um, I use headphones mostly Juan, mostly. Um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like there are a bunch of these conversations that still need to play out. Um, and, and I still need to go back and do kind of a, a roundup on Fio. We've got like a Fio plug-in DAC and a Fio Bluetooth DAC and looking at solutions for people who, they, they, you know, they're sort of crossover solutions. You can still power them from a portable device. You can use them to plug into a computer or a desktop. But like, what do you do if the audio on your mobile device really is kind of lame? I don't think the solution is always go to Bluetooth headphones. You might want to find something that can play nice with a cabled solution and then be kind of a kind of a um, complement, you know, or uh, some type of crossover or hybrid hybrid option. And Paul Purry is the first to say first. Yeah, good job, Paul. I mean, the chat's been going for a while, but you, you are first. <laughs> oh, and Fat Produce, the Discord crew really enjoyed hanging out in the voice chat on Friday. I loved that. So... 
um we run just a little discord attached to the patreon and uh <laughs> i was like andrew was like hey i want to jump into the voice chat i was like okay cool i'm building a bookshelf so everyone got to hear me hammering away <laughs> As I was building a bookshelf um, in my daughter's room. Uh, you know, that's the kind of high quality behind the scenes content you get from my Patreon, which is hilarious. I gotta get some water here. So, um, all, all of the stories, the links, um, everything that we're gonna be talking about today, housekeeping included, uh, will be available on the show notes for this week's episode on uh, somegadgetguide.com. Paul, Ikea, ASMR. So before we move on, I do want to say uh, yesterday I did make an Ikea run. I, I am unhealthily obsessed with Ikea uh, furniture and especially for like bookshelves and desks and stuff. I mean, it's I, I we bought I bought like a little a little student desk, the the base simplest $50. What is it? The Mikey? Um, hey, give it to Mikey. He'll eat anything. Uh, so the, for, for us, that's kind of a drive. It's like 45 minutes to get to an Ikea. And, uh, my daughter has never been to an Ikea. So, you know, I'm, I'm vaxxed. We've got plenty of masks for her. Um, she's five. We road tripped to, I, it was just me and Lex. I, I had to give my, my wife the morning off and, uh, we're, we're cruising, listening to music. We were, we were counting all of the old cars that we saw. She loves kind of picking out like old roadsters as they drive by us on California roads. It's how this one like crazy dropped. It looked almost like a, like a classic, you know, like 1940s race car. Someone was just driving on the freeway. Um, so we, we get out to Ikea and she has never seen a store that large before. And we had to stop in every single display. I don't know if you've ever tried to wrestle with the drunken cephalopod, which is a five-year-old who is overstimulated um, and hasn't been going out in public very often over the last year. But it was a pretty crazy experience. I think she had a pretty good time. I think it was a little overwhelming, um, but I think it was fun. And then I got to take her to like my favorite taqueria in Burbank. So she had a carnitas quesadilla, and I knew that she was like, like at, at sizzle point because as soon she was bouncing around in the car and vibrating at a much higher frequency than normal. And then I put a quesadilla in her hands, and it was thousand yard stare as she just wolfed down an adult serving of carnitas and quesadilla, just like looking into another dimension, <laughs> which was kind of amazing. It was a really fun day. Okay, so um, let's get into some news. Do, 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 do. All of my setup has changed. Ah, there we go. Here's my screen share. So I want to start off just kind of a light focus in, in in kind of the water is wet style of commentary this is just sort of an add-on to the topics that we've all been kind of following over the last couple of years major organizations humongous corporations data as a currency um on the internet and this just kind of confirming some of the feels that we probably already had about how our data is being used. So this is coming from Business Insider, written up by T Tyler Sonnemaker. Uh, let me get this. Apple is eating our lunch. Google employees admit in lawsuit that the company made it nearly impossible for users to keep their location private. Uh, newly unredacted documents in a lawsuit against Google revealed that the company's own executives and engineers knew just how difficult the company had made it for smartphone users to keep their location data private. This is a major topic where recently when we were looking at Google I.O., there's going to be a new feature in Android 12 to help you immediately sever some of the more personal and communication and location data sharing between uh, you know, Android and the various apps that are installed on your phone. Kind of a quick one button, nuke all the connections and make me recertify that apps should have access to my, to my content or to my, to my data. Business Insider has a really solid write-up on this. Um, and again, kind of tracking some of, uh, 
some of the timeline of this most recent lawsuit. So years back, I actually tried on a podcast to go through and change up like how how do I how do I make sure that I'm I'm really staying private on this? And and it was a labyrinthian exercise of going through different parts of settings and then settings would take you to your Google account, but that was different than your location sharing privileges in Google Maps and you had to disable this, but then you had to enable that. And changing this setting would disable another feature or sharing your content. And it, it it's still, I still think it's more difficult than it needs to be to track through all of that information. I think when you get into your Google account, it's it's sort of an overwhelming you know, like here's data and Google just kind of bombards you with all of the information that you can tweak and customize and, and prioritize. And I think it leaves a lot of consumers feeling like, well, I can't, I can't spend the time now. And you know, what? it's probably not worth it. <laughs> I feel like that's by design. So when we see these types of interviews and these types of conversations come out, that makes sense, you know, like th there's an overwhelming aspect to this. And I feel that's to Google's benefit so that people aren't looking as closely into their own behavior and Google's business uh, as it relates to their data. So uh, definitely worth a re read. And again, Business Insider, this is a pretty solid write up on just kind of condensing what this lawsuit was about and where these disclosures actually came from. <laughs> And from Gary the Fireman with a highlighted comment here, they told LG to move the location toggle to the second page in quick settings. <laughs> and you know, it's stuff like that that's just irksome. Because as a as a reviewer, and who, who, someone who doesn't consider themselves to be very influential, um, but I like to review things, it's those little UI tweaks that I think are the most galling. You, you, you put something there, and you have a, a pretty reasonable expectation that consumers won't go digging. I mean, when we talk about average consumers, um, I really hate that because we, we sort of assess the general broad consumer marketplace at a very low level. And instead of trying to educate and bring people up, we continuously just refocus our conversations down. At, at, to the lowest common denominator. And that kind of creates an echo chamber of reinforcing bad habits. And then we get on our high horses about, oh, but low, but but security and data privacy. And you're like, yeah, but we've been enforcing the narrative that well, people just don't care about that stuff, I guess. Instead of picking apart these types of business moves and relationships and, and the leverage that a humongous corporation can can leverage against some of their smaller manufacturing partners and and we should be doing a better job of calling that kind of stuff out i've got a couple of samsung stories coming up here in just a bit people are already going to call me a samsung hater so i might as well lean into it but if we don't sort of recognize who we're really doing business with we'll never be able to change consumer behavior in a way that's beneficial for all of us um, from Andrew, do you think that Google will update Android to have similar privacy protection opt-out features that iOS has brought in with iOS 14? I, I, I feel like because Apple has made that change so public, even though Apple is really not as good at privacy and security as their ads claim that they are, um, but because they've made so much noise about it, I think we'll get a flavor of it on Android. Um, I think I think enough is going to condition people to seek that out. Um, the marketing works, you know. I, when when we talk about people leaving one team to go to another team, significantly more people are leaving Android to go to iOS. Like that, those are just numbers that I don't think anyone has been able to refute. Like I, I feel especially in my personal experiences and in, 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 in my family, if my family isn't going to cheaper phones, they're going to iPhones. That, that's, that's it. So few of my friends and family are buying top-tier premium Android. 
If they're going to spend over $600, it's going to be an iPhone. If they're going to spend under $600, it's going to be a, a Pixel, or it's going to be one of these new tier of like two to $300, like, ah, I'll use it for a year and I'll flip it, or I'm on an MVNO and I just want the cheapest phone I can get out the door with. So because Apple has made this noise on it, I, I feel like Google will probably do something similar. It will probably just be more convoluted because it's Google. I, I don't even mean like... Google will try and break what Apple did to circumvent, to get data. It, uh, I think it was about two months back we talked about Google changing up a, a number of their ad buying services and how cookies were implemented on computers. And they're looking at other methods for tracking, for uh, accruing good advertiser data, how do you manage trends. So Google's already reassessing a part of their business. How that impacts Android We'll have to see, but I very, very much believe that we'll see some kind of pivot from Google. And again, I don't think Google has much incentive to make this better for Facebook. Again, as soon as you shy away from that conversation, you're immediately going to be called out as, you know, like, well, you're just selling our data and, oh, you're doing this with Facebook and, oh, Apple cares about our privacy. Um which is good marketing, but I don't I don't know how true that really plays out. <laughs> oh, we've got a fun little conversation kind of bouncing back and forth. Looks like Sam is 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 kind of digging on his uh OnePlus 9 Pro. So now it's Sam and Dave Burns with OnePlus 9 Pros. Do I have mine? Yeah, mine's over here on the table. A little OnePlus 9 Pro club going on right here. All right, um, moving right along, let's uh, let's get into, um, I, I think this is actually an exciting piece of news. Um, let me get this back here. I'm so sorry. It's going to take me that extra second to remember, like, how do I share my screen on OBS? <laughs> uh, we recently heard of the demise of Windows 10X. You know, wh where, where uh, sorry, let me, let me get out of screen share here. So Surface Duo. I've got my Surface Duo. Yes, Android device. There was going to be the Surface Neo, which was going to be a larger dual screen tablet running a customized build of Windows, which we've seen Microsoft playing this game since the original Surface. Um, there was going to be Windows and then Windows RT. And then there was going to be like a Windows 10 Lite edition and then Windows 10 something else and Windows 10 Element OP. And we got to the Surface Neo and there was going to be a Windows 10X. And we recently talked about how Windows 10X is basically dead, defunct. It's totally shelved. And I feel this is the right play. In the whole grand landscape of CPU architecture, of components, shortages, Intel, I think this just this morning said that there, we can expect component shortages to last for a couple of years. Um, the, the timeline on getting products to consumers is so out of whack. It's going to take us years to fully recover and get kind of back to where we were. So I don't really feel it made a ton of sense to make a stripped version of Windows, which was going to run on traditional computing hardware. You know, an Intel processor, you know, your, your normal CPU, GPU, RAM, hard drive kind of arrangement does not need a simplified version of Windows. Uh, well, I mean, what it is, is it's a large thing with two screens, so you can do dual display and multitasking. No, regular Windows. Just make it regular Windows. It's fine. If it's x86, you don't need to cut out all of the legacy support for stuff. Just keep up with regular Windows. But we know, and especially thanks to Apple and the M1, ARM CPUs are looking to take over a huge chunk of the consumer computing market. Like I've been saying for years now, <laughs> the ARM-based CPUs in your phones and tablets are gross overkill for the bare minimum average consumer stuff that we, we put them on. I mean, especially if we're getting into like Snapdragon 888s. Silly. Silly to own that kind of hardware if you don't have some design on pushing your mobile devices a little bit harder. That was a really rambling diatribe to get to this to this article, but it, it, it was encouraging to me because 
ARM is the transition. ARM CPUs, I feel, when properly optimized for their software, are going to be humongous consumer benefits for low-cost, um, powerful, good battery life kinds of products. And it's, uh, that already plays out. That, that already rings true for things like Chromebooks. So if Microsoft is going to get on this train, Windows 10X wasn't the ride. Windows on ARM is the ride. That's where they need to be. So uh, Qualcomm announces new Windows on ARM testing kit, and it's a cute little black box. It looks kind of like a rounder, softer Mac mini, and there's a big old Qualcomm Snapdragon sticker on the front, big old power button on the top. And this is exactly, this is exactly what we, what we need to kind of kickstart some of this development. Um, Apple is is sucking all the air out of this conversation with the M1 and all the companies that are just rushing to support M1 and make native software for M1 and, and play into the Apple Mac OS app store. And at the same time, you know, we've, we've had these types of devices out for a bit. So I'm going to be linking to IT World Canada. Um, Tom Lee wrote up this this brief look at the the dev kit, but we've got to get the competition going on getting apps and services and data over to a wider variety of products. You know, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the M1 being in an iPad is Apple is currently the only company that can kind of nudge developers to take mobile computing more seriously. So while the iPad Pro has all these limitations and you really cannot use the full power of this slate just yet, and I would never recommend buying a product on the promise of what it might have to offer in a year or two, I'm very encouraged to see Apple actually moving that hardware forward so that developers will try to take advantage of it and will get better apps and services to all of our products. I, I, I feel like we're still talking about phone apps as if we were back on like Android KitKat, you know, like Android 4.4, um, instead of recognizing just how insanely capable these apps have gotten. And really what we're lacking are some of the better tools to move an app to a display or interact with a game controller or fire up a keyboard and mouse. It sounds silly, but I've been doing writing on phones for years now my little folding Bluetooth keyboard, and I started in earnest with my LG V20. Great big screen on a phone, works perfectly on a little airplane, you know, um, uh, fold-out tray. Instead of trying to put a laptop there, don't. Your phone is better for that. So um, th this, is, this is the kind of stuff. I, I, I wanna see Microsoft get more aggressive not just about putting their services on other platforms, but about making their platform a place to go. You know, maybe a Duo, a Surface Duo 2 or a Surface Duo 3 will finally be able to run Windows on ARM. You know, there's no reason why a Snapdragon 855 or a more powerful chipset can't run a reasonably competent Windows environment if it really is focused for supporting um, this kind of hardware. And again, everyone's going to slam Microsoft. Windows on ARM, it does a terrible job of emulating this legacy software from I've been using since Windows 98. Instead of moving forward <laughs> and getting developers to properly support ARM hardware. Um, from 20 Miles, from Sam, I'm bummed the Neo looks to be canceled uh, due to Windows 10X no longer being worked on. I, I, I imagine that the Neo hardware will probably resurface as something like the duo because the duo was not this 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 form factor this build was not originally intended to run android um it was going to be its own sort of microsoft powered os simplified windows thing again like another iteration on this windows rt idea and the pivot to android i think made it an interesting series of compromises, but a better overall product than trying to launch an operating system um, at the same time as you're making your first Surface phone. You know, like that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I, I don't think the Neo concept is gone. I just think what would have been the Neo is obviously 
not going to be a thing. Um, from Andrew, I, honestly, I would like Microsoft to focus on getting their Android software polished and squeaky clean for further releases of the Duo and possibly using that software on a Neo device. I, I don't want to turn this into another look at the at the, at the the Duo. Um, and I don't know if Sam wants to weigh in on any of this too. The last OTA was miserable. The current OTA for the Duo is really good. Um, so if you're on the beta builds of the Microsoft launcher and Microsoft keyboard, and you're on the most up-to-date OTA, and you're, you also make sure that you've been keeping up with your Google Play services updates, the Duo has never been running better IMO. Um, again, single-handedly reviving any interest that I've ever had in an Android-powered tablet, I, it, it is... It is so much better and it kind of reinforces like why I appreciate split screen and multitasking on slates. You know, why I think iPad OS is better than iOS. And here it's it's on this pocketable folding dual display, beautiful piece of hardware. Duo has been really strong. So if you've been picking one up on like those fire sales, I, I think now is a good time to really play with what they can do with the tablet. Mm -hmm. Oh, Gary the Fireman, Professor Gary uh, from Gary Explains, an absolutely stonking good YouTube channel that you should be checking out. Uh, Professor Gary was saying that the Qualcomm development device needs to be like Raspberry Pi cheap. I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, if, if we're really going to move this experiment along, unfortunately, the reality of the market that we're in, if this is an expensive dev box people are just going to bounce. Excuse me. Microsoft has such a such a funky long-term relationship with developers from Balmer running around sweating on stage yelling developers, developers, and then making development on Windows Phone exceedingly difficult to keep up with. Um th this this is one I completely agree with Gary. Normally I'm not the guy to say, "Oh, if you're only going to complain about the price, then you don't understand how this stuff works. But this is one of those opportunities where Microsoft working with Qualcomm, they need to buy into some good develop goodwill for developers. And I, if this is a pricey box to work on, this is going to tank Windows on ARM on its first steps. If anything, you go to a couple core app developers, major services, things that need to be on on tablets and laptops, and you just give them <laughs> the dev boxes. And then anyone else interested in this, you sell them those dev boxes at incredibly subsidized prices to get them interested in supporting the world's largest group of OS users. Again, like... We're so hyped up on Apple M1, and Apple represents less than 10% of the home consumer PC market. Um, what are we doing? <laughs> Come on, Microsoft. Like, you've got this, this juggernaut, this, this behemoth of an operating system environment, and it really shouldn't be this difficult to get people considering or supporting uh, development on your platform. So that's that's fun. <laughs> um, from Heike, I bought a Samsung Galaxy Tab S5e for 100 euro and it has a 600 series processor and it's still a great all round device. Even the 600 series has enough power to deliver daily tasks. Um, I can't remember my daughter's tablet is an old Huawei with one of their mid-ranger Kirins. And same, like, it's got active pen stylus support. Um, the, she likes to run around shooting little video snippets on the cameras. It plays all of the games that she likes to play. And, and I think, that, like, when it retailed, it was, like, a $200 tablet brand spanking new that it, it was immediately, like, price cut to $150. Um 
the the capabilities of our mobile devices are absolutely stunningly um phenomenally incredible and to 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 watch people like boil down the phone experience to like well i like to scan through instagram and open up a couple tiktoks and then disregard the notion that you can do more is is hilariously sad you know like you have to laugh just to keep from crying about how much of a waste <laughs> this stuff is but that also should hopefully like you take something like the snapdragon 888 you know i've got my one plus nine pro here and I feel like that chipset, the architecture on that, increasingly in my brain, is making more sense for tablets and always connected PCs, uh, you know, great cell phone reception. You've got more room to kind of pad them out, and you can maybe add active cooling. And all of the benefits of that SOC, having the CPU and the GPU stapled together on that, start to make a bit more sense in my brain if we could put something like that into a surface style notebook um, and, and there you would be better um, use utilizing some of that incredible horsepower where our phones maybe don't have the surface area to properly cool that that kind of hardware it, it's um it's heady stuff and, and really this is where I'm always disappointed in the counter to whatever Apple does Apple does something incredible with the M1. The M1 looks like a beast of a CPU design. They've obviously, um, Apple's investment in making their own SOCs is obviously paying off. And then the, the rest of the industry takes two years to figure out, you know, maybe we should do something about that. Where, you know, nerds, if you've been in my, in my streams, we've been like screaming about this, like off in the background. Dex, Huawei desktop mode, Chromebooks, Look at all of these examples of people using mid-range and lower tier <laughs> SOCs from phones to power laptop style experience. I don't know if we can really do that though. I don't know if average consumers are going to grab it. I mean, average consumers are really invested in their x86 legacy software. I mean, I think that's been proven. You know, it's not that they just use a web browser and they basically turn a cheap laptop into a Chromebook anyway. It, I'm, they, they, they probably have like 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 a MIDI program that stopped being worked on in 2003. And so they, they need that that legacy x86 support. That's the only way they can get work done. It, it's so frustrating because we keep moving the goalposts. Apple does this. It's amazing. Oh, we can't do that on a Microsoft box it would be the same <laughs> can't be the same <sighs> oh sorry for bad english is telling me to stretch that is an excellent idea oh ooh, my shoulders just clicked ah, that felt good and aditya told me to hydrate but I, I just took a drink of water from uh from er 1980 i use my wife's lenovo chromebook duet more than she does but it's great as a two-in-one and android apps run fine also i use it to watch most live streams including this one hey welcome to the live stream um let me tell you uh my daughter did her entire last year of school um abusing the crap out of the pixel book go and that laptop just kept coming back for more. I need to do another follow-up video, like long, long-term look back at the Pixelbook Go because that thing has been a lifesaver. It was gross overkill for just sort of the family web browser. Um, her using it for school and for assignments and for video streams, and she's really good at Zoom, <laughs> like when she jumps on Zoom calls and she's five. Um, it's... Uh, it, it was it was a lifesaver um, having that just floating around the house um, for the last year. And, and again, that wasn't one of the top of the line models. I believe mine was a Core i5. Um, great, stunning, stunning, um, super, super useful. So I've got a pair of Samsung stories here because I'm always super cranky about Samsung. I, I really do kind of want to lean into this and kind of preface it. Um, my feelings as a tech reviewer head in the direction that a company who is supposedly a market leader and makes the boldest and the biggest claims about their business practices should be held to a higher standard. I do not believe that just because Samsung products are the most popular in the Android community, 
that that should give them a pass. Like, I don't feel like we should judge smaller brands harder than bigger brands. That That's always going to be my flow chart. And I genuinely, as an individual, when I am spending money on products, I don't like the way that Samsung chooses to do business. I don't like that they are now leaning on Walmart-style heavy subsidies. I don't like that they're purposely trying to wreck the resale market so that they can encourage their users to stick with their own trade-in programs. I don't like how they've been caught manipulating the prices on components. I don't like how their top executives, many of them are in under investigation or in prison for market manipulation and for bribing South Korean political officials. This is not, I mean, if you were to just break down, Samsung is a mega corporation. This isn't necessarily a company I would want to do business with in the same way that I avoid shopping at big box retailers like Walmart. And I choose to spend my money at Costco. I am making a choice with my money to support business practices that I agree with. And Samsung increasingly has not been on that list. Down to the fact that the last major Samsung purchase I made is a really expensive TV that is now increasingly serving me ads. And now that we've moved and I haven't hooked it back up to the Wi-Fi, every time I turn my TV on, it has to give me this really obnoxious splash screen of, we can't connect to Samsung servers. I guess your TV just can't be used for anything until that finally goes away and my Chromecast pops up. My Chromecast is so much better than uh, anything that Samsung has put on onto their super dumb smart TVs. But I digress. So I don't want to completely read through this entire article. I am such a huge nerd fan of iFixit. I don't like gadget destruction porn on YouTube. I don't like breaking gadgets, pretending that it's some kind of durability testing. I absolutely adore the white glove presentation of gadget disassembly on iFixit. And their editorials are, especially in this new sort of renewed interest in right to repair, um, their editorials are just so well thought out, crafted, and supportive of this notion, of, of this conversation to get more out of your gadget purchases. So they took a quick look at the current implementation of Galaxy upcycling. And uh, I, I really hope that after this podcast, everyone is is going to go and check this, read through this. Like I said, it's going to be linked on some gadgetguy.com, but you can find it on ifixit.com, written up by Kevin Purdy. Galaxy upcycling, how Samsung ruined their best idea in years. And there was an original concept for upcycling where there would be software to flash and you would have more access. You would unlock bootloaders. You could keep a phone running longer, even if it didn't have Samsung software on it. And kind of like Dex with Linux, that original concept of the program was all scrapped. And instead, what you can do, and I love this. This is this is from Kevin Purdy's. I'm going to read part of the article here. The new version of Galaxy Upcycling at Home turns the high-powered S9, once sold as the phone reimagined, into a single-purpose light or sound sensor inside the SmartThing Smart Home system. That's it. That's the upcycle. So instead of an actually old Galaxy becoming an automatic pet feeder, full-fledged Linux computer, retro game console, wooden owl Alexa alternative, or anything else that you or a community of hackers can dream of, the new program will take a phone you can still sell for $160 and turn it into something like a $30 sensor. This is not the gig. First of all, the Galaxy S9 is still a remarkably capable device today. <laughs> let's 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 just pause on that real, real quick. A Galaxy S9 is going to outperform most 700 series mid-rangers today. So phones in that like 2 to 400 dollar price tier, the hardware in an S9 is still more capable than what we what we would pay more for 
And again, the fact that you can pick up an S9 for under 200 bucks used and in good condition, pretty easy, thanks to the fact that Samsung goes out of their way to wreck the value and trade in and resale uh, on, on their older devices. You could just use it as a phone. It's still a really good phone. The S9 and Note 9, brilliant devices still. Great. Just just solid, great all-rounders. Um, it kills me that that's as far back as they've gone. So allow me to share with you, um, this is my uh, always within arm's reach Samsung Galaxy Note 4. Uh, still one of the all-time best phones ever made ever. Uh, last year, I replaced the battery and it didn't require any tools because you can just peel the back of the phone off. And this phone was so stupid popular. There are a plethora of Note 4 batteries out in the market that you can still buy. So it got a battery upgrade and I was able to find a larger than stock battery that had the uh, um, NFC antenna because Samsung also used to do that really obnoxious anti-consumer thing where they would build the antennas into their batteries so that you wouldn't use third-party batteries but then third-party battery manufacturers just added the coil so that you could uh, you could still use NFC I still use this on almost every single video I produce um this is the perfect shape form factor and uh, I love that the back material is rubbery and grippy for the tiny little um, teleprompter that I use. So this, this uh, I can actually do this live. We're doing it live. So I'm, I'm probably gonna lose about a half stop of light here, but I just slide that on. And then I put my phone just right under um, on a little clip on a little plastic stand. And then I can read notes or if I wanna write out a full script, I can write out a full script and it works brilliantly. This is like the best phone in my collection. It fits this setup perfectly for creating content. That's a Note 4. And and it, I didn't have to flash any stupid software. I didn't have to like gut the other functionality of this to turn it into just like some stupid sensor. I, you, you just use it for something else. It was perfectly capable just being used without going through this process here. The fact that Samsung's upcycling is only going back to S9s and is doing something that could easily be achieved with some kind of like, I don't know, like a Raspberry Pi or, or some other type of hobbyist, you know, computing uh, setup is, is so silly. I, I, it's so disappointing that this is, this is what they've decided to do for, for their big recycling. Up, oh, we're going to upcycle. It's super great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I got to catch up on the comments here. I, I was kind of going off on a while there. I, I, I did kind of ramble us through um, <laughs> a bit of my uh, Samsung ennui. Access, uh, Access One TV subscribed, tier one sub there. Thank you so much, Access One. I really appreciate that. Excuse me. And El Jefe Reviews. Hey, what's up, Jeff? How's it going, man? I'm so glad you dropped by. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me scroll down here. Gabaletta, I love my S9 Plus. Fingerprint sensor, iris scanner, headphone jack, stereo speakers, IP rating, decent cameras, and it can do wireless decks. <sighs> Remember when phones had features? Oh, don't forget. Uh, did you, did you, did you did say MST and uh, memory card slot? Your S9 is still um, probably a better phone than a lot of S21s. <clears throat> Simon to say no. The S9 has a Snapdragon 845. That's actually certainly ancient. King Arthur had one. <laughs> and I love that. I love that as part of like the like if you're on our Android, you're like, oh, how could you use a Snapdragon 845? And then the like the the exact next post will be like, I absolutely love this two hundred dollar mid ranger that has a Snapdragon 730. I've got the um, the Xiaomi uh, Mi 11 Lite LTE. So the 4G version of that has a 730. That phone is a screamer. And that phone is less powerful than an S9. 
There is no reason why phones with 845s shouldn't be performing lightning fast by today's standards. They need software polish. They need updates. And if you were really using an S9 as your daily driver, you probably need to swap the battery. But that's like 100 bucks as opposed to buying a whole new phone. That's killing me. Killing me. It, we could be getting so much more. All right. <laughs> Let me just kind of catch up on the rest of these here. Um, Fat Produce, is that Note 4 not going to work soon with non-VOLTE devices being phased out? I need to look it up because um, it is LTE. But mine's an AT&T model, so knowing AT&T, it's probably just going to be uh, probably going to get bounced regardless. Um, that's a very good question. I need to start looking up better what the cutoffs are because I, I, I could have sworn that like LTE devices starting Galaxy S5 were going to be supported still on this push as we get rid of um, VOLTE uh, non-compliant devices on, on networks. Someone correct me there because I think I, I have that wrong now, but I could have sworn it was S5 and newer, but maybe it was like S6. I can't remember. From Do Mer, why can't Samsung just disable the Knox E fuse once the device is on their last update? No one uses Samsung Pay anyway since they dropped MST. And on my FE, there even is no such thing as Samsung Pay, so I see no point in having Knox. Again, it's uh, Samsung is is trying to convince us that th their notion of longevity, their notion of support, and their additional software features with how heavily integrated. Know one UI and their skins are is th that's their product. It's not the hardware and what you can do with it. It's their total package. And when they say you're done with it, you're done with it. And then you have to go and buy a new phone. And that's where I disagree. And where articles like this "I Fix It" editorial are are beautiful to read through. <laughs> Plethora, big words alert. Sorry, any anytime. Um, El Jefe. I mean, again, I, should, I feel like El Jefe should 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 appreciate that. You know, me trying to pull off an El Guapo. <laughs> I don't want you telling me I have a plethora if you don't know what a plethora is. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm not going to turn this into me doing animated voices and <laughs> bad impressions of my favorite movie lines. Uh Oh, Gary the Fireman, CNBC posted a couple of videos about battery tech in the last few days. That could be worth a look. I definitely think that could be worth a look. <laughs> DTO, maybe the real plethora were the friends we made along the way. Um, we do have another Samsung follow-up here. Um, this is just another data point in why I'm... Why I don't like supporting Samsung's business practices from being one of the most obnoxious Samsung Knights that you would find to them pivoting their business strategy and kind of walking away from users like me. Again, I didn't leave Samsung as much as Samsung left me. Um, where, where, especially from like the Galaxy S8 on, I, like I'm still considering whether or not I want to hunt down a Galaxy S8 active, one of the best phones ever made, like my Note. I, I cannot say enough nice things about the active lines of phones. But one of the things that's, that's always irked me about Samsung is the tone that they craft around their company is divisive, insulting, and kind of toxic. Um, it, you know, it's like when you're in a group of friends and there's a lot of context and you can make fun of your friends and you understand what the rules are, but then you bring someone else in and they make like a horribly off color joke because they don't get the rules, but they think they're being, you know, you know, brutal and funny too. And then it shuts everything down and everyone's sort of embarrassed on behalf of that new person. Samsung kind of, Samsung marketing kind of reminds me of that. You know, when we saw the very first Samsung commercial making fun of people who would line up for iPhones, it was a witty little jab at something that was 
silly, but was a part of Apple lifestyle, was a part of Apple culture. New iPhones coming out. We're going to go line up at an Apple store. And, you know, as a one-off, that's kind of a fun little poke. You know, a bunch of people using Galaxies. Oh, the new, the, the next big thing is already here. Enjoy waiting in line. We're going to go. Bye. The success of that ad, though, crafted an entire tone of commentary and marketing where Samsung started very vilely going after everything Apple related. Not just making fun of Apple as a corporation, also making fun of Apple employees. They're always these doddering, hipster, know-nothings. And then really, again, distastefully going after Apple consumers. And I don't know about you, but if I owned an iPhone and I started watching a bunch of Samsung ads, it would not make me want to buy a Samsung. It would really put my back up I'd really be bristling and I'd be doubling down even harder on staying team iOS. It is increasingly toxic and it, and it does what we see online. Samsung is in part responsible for this extremely divisive toxic commentary from the most obnoxious gadget nerds out there um, who, who brigade. You know, if I put out a video saying something nice about another company, like I've got a bunch of people, someone, someone hit my last one plus nine pro video going, oh, you've made four videos on the one pluses. I can see you're totally biased against Samsung. <laughs> like, <more. laughs> As opposed to all of those try hard channels that are making video after video, after video, after video, after video of Samsung products. I made four sort of a first impressions, a, a commentary on camera performance. And, and those weren't all on the OnePlus 9 Pro. I made two videos that were way more focused on the OnePlus 9 and then two videos that were way more focused on the 9 Pro. And now that makes me biased against Samsung. And I wish that that was like a singular kind of comment, but it's constant. I am every day weeding out of my comments people who only come to trash every other brand that isn't Samsung. iPhone owners don't brigade on my other videos. They run into my iPhone videos to say they're over people criticizing Apple. Oh, you're just an Apple hater. I'm over this. But they're not on every other video. Because Apple stands alone. Apple stands apart. And Samsung seems to not be able to craft much of a corporate identity outside of, we're the company that poop talks Apple users. Isn't that fun, guys? You can go into your circles of family and friends and tell your family what terrible decisions they've been making by owning iPhones. Isn't that going to make you the life of the party? This was all... All... all the 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 venom like you know the actually it's not even the venom it's not even that that potent it's like the bile <laughs> the, the the stomach bile i have dealing with samsung marketing and pr um because <laughs> we still got to talk about the story here let me go into screen share before i i extrapolate further uh samsung's back at it again uh apple's iphone 12 pro camera is shamefully bad Parenthetical says Samsung. This is written up by Chris Mat Mat Matcheski. Matcheski. I have no idea how to pronounce Chris's last name, but this is from ZDNet.com. And basically, Samsung has a bunch of ads talking about how garbage the iPhone 12 Pro Max cameras are. And this is totally a if you live in glass houses, you shouldn't throw stones. Because let me tell you. I'm not super impressed with Samsung's camera architecture either. Um, I feel like Apple and Samsung are getting all this credit for using larger camera sensors, but they're not making better images than other competing services. All of these like techies that are <clears throat> apparently terrible at photography have been ignoring companies like Huawei. I mean, Huawei gets that token like, yep, they've got those great cameras, I guess, but I don't know, I can't recommend one. 
And then Samsung finally comes out with a larger image sensor on their most expensive phones. And they're like, oh, see, that's the, the only standard by which we can grade cameras now. So these, I, I don't want to play the video because it'll probably give me a copyright strike or something. But I just want you to look at this. This is like, this is so dumb and 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 reductive and built to only pat Samsung users on the back. These two terribly composed photos of a grilled cheese sandwich and what they do in this video is zoom way in on the pixel peeping details of the bread. And I'm so tired of seeing people do that. I take a composition um like in the Discord, I shared a photo of the back of Lex's head because we were we, we were out and we were hitting um, uh, like an open air mall, and we had to stop because there was this little trio, um, uh, you know, a, a singer songwriter, um, someone playing the drums, and and a, an acoustic guitar, and my daughter has not seen any live music <laughs> that she can remember. The last time she saw live musicians she it was for her third birthday party at the at the la zoo um we had to stop and we were listening and she was like kind of jamming and dancing in on the sidewalk and it was just this really sweet moment and i take the shot and i compose it and it's her head in focus the band's out of focus and it looks great the moment is my daughter dancing to music I do not care if you're impressed by zooming in 800% to look at look at all the little details in her hair. Isn't that amazing? Oh my gosh, you can see like the little rubber band scrunchy thing that you did her ponytail in. That's one of the easiest ways to encourage me to never share a personal moment with you ever again the moment is my daughter getting to hear live music for the first time in over two years the moment is not how nifty it is that there's slightly finer pixel level detail on the scrunchie around her hair so samsung doesn't have a good argument here i don't know of anyone who's really objectively or rationally considering the differences in camera architecture who's going to pick up the most expensive iphone and go you know what when i zoom in to like a million percent i don't see as many crumbs on this sandwich hmm better luck next time apple that's not a thing and samsung trying to make that the conversation just shows again they don't have the camera solution that they're touting. They are not saying we've got a capable all-rounder shooter with good HDR performance and on a sensor that if you capture the raw data, you can create some stunning photos with some editing. They're saying everyday epic. They are making the claim that they have professional grade cameras, epic performance. Those are Samsung's words and their products do not live up to their marketing claims. So what do they do? Do they fall back on, on, on more, more advertising highlighting their products? No. They go out to Galaxy owners and say, look at how garbage this grilled cheese sandwich is from an iPhone 12. <laughs> oh, those Apple sheep. <laughs> And all of these Samsung acolytes just, just lap it up. You're right. I did make a good purchase by buying Samsung instead of an iPhone. I'm the most smarts. And it's sickening. It's sickening how well it works. Because it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't contribute to a, a, a highlight on what makes a product better. It's only punching down on other companies. I actually shouldn't say punching down because I feel like Apple can defend themselves. But you know, this gets warped into the larger gadget influencer conversation. It's totally fine to punch down on OnePlus, on Motorola. We watched people savage LG for years when LG had objectively competitive products. And 
instead we're just sitting there like <laughs> we're just so clever i read uh, samsung's marketing brief and now i know everything about smartphones because samsung is the best they sell the most so they're the most popular they must be the best and it's so dumb it's just so dumb so an ad like this <laughs> let me zoom in on a grilled cheese sandwich it's a terrible photo first of all Samsung should be ashamed of themselves for even trying to act like this was the Instagram shot. It's awful. I've seen so many people like my, my, my sister does not take lunch selfie photos and share them on Instagram. I'm almost positive. She can pull off a better shot of a grilled cheese than what Samsung has here. And she has a pixel three a, <sighs> Sorry, I'm. <laughs> I'm so way behind on the chat. I might not be able to catch up on this. Oh, Sam's making fun of me for being a one plus shill, and he totally missed the Juan plus gag. I mean, I'm a one plus shill. Um... <laughs> Oh, Arthur Lee, I'm a Juan Bagnell knight. Well, I appreciate that. I, again, I, it's like every single time I can see when one of my videos gets shared on our Android. And you're like, oh, now I got to deal with this garbage. It's like, I'd rather just have comments that we could have cool conversations in. But now I've got to be snarkier in my videos because I just don't want that kind of noise in my comments. I read that stuff. Um... <laughs> from snorkel i suppose lg can't be accused of using toxic marketing techniques since they didn't do much marketing at all <laughs> so um uh lg was accused of uh, re remember when some very high tier youtubers who should know better about like ftc disclosures decided that it's totally fine to see samsung and apple products as a uh, you know as, as product placement like we never hear them complain complain about iPhones being in movies or Samsung's being in in TV shows but it was a bridge too far when M&M had an LG V60 pop up briefly what was the video was it Godzilla um suddenly that w why isn't there hashtag ad on on this music video from from M&M because we see an LG pop up. Uh, where, where's the disclosure? I'm so concerned that LG is doing some product integration on music videos. So it was, you were never going to win. <laughs> oh, but there was, there was a really creepy, what, was it in Germany? They did the awful, like, old guy in terrible old age makeup doing a creeper upskirt shot. Um, with the V60, which has like nothing to do with the V60. Um, yeah, that one was really bad. Uh, off the top of my head, I think that's all I can really pin LG down on. Um, I'm really trying to think if there have been any other missteps on LG marketing. Yeah, Loki Ted it was not a good look for a YouTuber or content creator who should know better about FTC disclosures really showing his hand on what products he was allowed to criticize and what products he's totally fine operating in much more egregious ways. Um, let me get through all this. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Access one TV, some punchable face guy, some LG shill guy, Carlos cartel. <gasps> I kind of like Carlos cartel, especially wearing this Kangle. Because I'm feeling very, like, community-oriented. Like, this is not my live stream, comrades. This is our live stream. Cartel is a good good word for that. Because I'm feeling this this look right here. <laughs> I'm going to stop it right there before I say something really dumb and insensitive. Um, from Utaku, I totally agree. You're explaining exactly what I've been feeling about Samsung. I just don't feel like buying anything from them at this point, And this is a big part of why. Um... It's frustrating. I, I don't feel they're they're really operating as a market leader. And and that's what the number one selling company in mobile, I, I want them to drive this discussion. And instead, this feels 
This doesn't feel like what I think it should be. Oh, a DTNL. Thank you. The LG ad, which was horrible, was in Poland. <laughs> yeah, that was such a dumb um, uh, thing for LG to do. Because again, it's like you get so little recognition for any type of marketing. Um, the V50 commercial was terrible. The G, uh, was it G7? The one where it's like Aubrey Plaza taking a selfie with Google Assistant. Like all of LG's ads have been so bad. And that the one that gets the most notice is unfortunately the one that really steers into uh, a very objectionable territory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Loki Ted. Meanwhile, nothing at all was said about 10 years of Beats product placement. I mean, like, was were, were these influencers watching, like, Parks and Rec going, Oh, I saw a close-up of a Nokia Windows phone on an NBC sitcom. <clears throat> hashtag ad, hashtag ad. It's like, it's like you, you had to go out of your way to not understand how FTC stuff works. Come on. Gabaletta, LG was always the punching bag for tech. Now it's going to be OnePlus. Totally agree. Oh, Kappa Cash. Okay, so this is different. Uh, Kappa Cash, you're absolutely correct. I didn't like the LG ad with Jason Statham. Um, I didn't like that one. I didn't like the zombie selfie. I didn't like the... Um, I, 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 I'm trying to remember. Like, I want to say it was... LG G2, where they did kind of like a, I don't know, what what is that festival where they're throwing like like dried dyes and paints and you're getting like covered and everything's all crazy and rainbow. I want to say that was for the G2. Might have been the G3. But, you know, again, talking about like we've got these great displays and we've got these good cameras. And I thought that was like one of the best kind of organic LG ads, you know, it was really pretty and vibrant, but that it showed people using the phone to capture an incredible daily life moment. And ever since then, I kind of feel like LG marketing has completely forgotten to combine those two ideas. So you either get something that's wacky, like Jason Statham playing every character and in a little action set piece, and then they never show you the G5. Or you get stuff like the hit record commercials where you've got Joseph Gordon-Levitt drumming in a subway station, but they never show you, oh, by the way, we're selling this phone called the V30. <laughs> you know, like it's just cool, hip, young people doing cool, hip, young things. And then they never, they never show you the phone. So you can't attach cool, hip, young people if you don't see the product that the cool, hip, young people are supposedly using. So I've always had those issues with LG marketing. I feel like every single time they would go high concept, they would miss the point of selling the phone, which would just make me sad. Ah. Um. Oh, I don't think I ever saw that. Um, King Turtle saying, I remember they did an LG Velvet as ad with Marlon Wayans, um, and their V10 ad was pretty solid. I don't think I ever saw the Marlon Wayans one. I think I'm going to have to pull that up. A Velvet commercial with Marlon Wayans would have been right up my alley. Um, From Brad's Ghost, what made me stop using LG is that I had a bootload problem with both LG phones I had didn't root, unlock, or bootload. Um, The main issue with bootlooping was G4. So again, every phone that had a Snapdragon 808 or Snapdragon 810 eventually developed some kind of irreparable fault. And at the same time, that generation of Samsungs all had horrifically bad battery um, power management issues where I have a, a an S6 that is full spicy pillow. And I think I'm going to have to give up on it because I've even called a couple shops to like, hey, can I get this repaired? And one guy said, please don't bring that in. <laughs> one repair shop told me, no, we're not going to work on that phone. Just please don't bring it into our shop. So there's my Galaxy S6 with a handful of photos that are from my wife's pregnancy with Lex on it. And I'm sad because I probably won't be able to get those back. But again, that's kind of like saying like iPhones bend or notes explode. The boot looping as a as a continued issue with the entire lineup of LG products was was a bit was a bit old. So it, it's it's fun. 
And Gary, the fireman, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, is one talented mofo. So uh, why don't we take a quick break here and get into some subreddit chat. Get this out of the way here. Every podcast has a subreddit. My podcast is no exception. But instead of my subreddit being about me, even though it is kind of about me this week, uh, really what I want to try and help and build and encourage is a platform for, to help people share and promote and find and discover uh, content, uh, technology-based content that they might not be able to see as readily thanks to the YouTube algorithm being uh, an obnoxious gatekeeper between content creators and, and their audiences. So if you go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, you'll see some of the highlights of, of the tech community and a broader conversation around tech topics. And number one, I want my subreddit. Ooh, ooh. It is not always a foregone conclusion that I am at the top of my own subreddit. And especially over the last couple of weeks where I haven't been putting out as much stuff, but this one seemed to resonate. Um, oh, I can, I can just open this up. I didn't have to... So this was a video that, if you were on the Patreon, was early access. So I put it out a couple weeks ago. But I, I did a video where I started just, it was just going to be a brief highlight on the LG Velvet getting Android 11. What that video turned into was 45 minutes of me complaining about losing features on phones. And then I cut that down, and there's a half hour... <laughs> editorial uh, dial rambling diatribe from old man who's yelling at kids to get off his lawn if you watch my podcast you've probably heard me bringing up some of those points um but that took the top of the the subreddit this week um number one with a bullet lg velvet revisited the last great feature-packed mid-ranger uh number two oh let me let me pull this back up Number two, we've got Josh Vergara checking out the Asus Zenfone 8 real-world camera test. Um, I'm not going to count this as number three because the podcast was sort of more of a move-in, but this did technically hit number three. But Adam Reviews Tech, 3,000 subscribers checking out the Galaxy S20 Ultra in 2021. Um, then we've got Gary Explains talking about Performance Core and Cortex A710. So two new ARM V9 cores for smartphones. So we're going to be seeing sort of uh, the, the, the focus on smartphone performance doubling down on these big core kinds of uh, CPU. So if, if, you, if you get into CPU um, design and fabrication, and uh, first of all, Gary explains, you need to be subscribed to Gary, and then you also need to be subscribed to Tech Tech Potato. Um, that's Dr. Ian's personal YouTube channel. He writes for Anantech. Um, the, the processor architecture is getting kind of weird. So if you ever look up what's actually in your CPU in a phone, you're probably gonna see three stacks of different types of CPU cores. And so Gary breaks down what the next generation of this layout is gonna look like. The video that I just watched this morning, and again, I, I gotta throw a huge shout out to Trent. Um, uh, Trent's Tech, which used to be, I think, uh, what was it, Tech Rant was his uh, the, the old name of his channel, but he's, he's turned it back into his name. Why I'm returning the base model 24 inch iMac, Apple failed to mention this. Ooh, I wonder what it could be. But Trent's only at 6,000 subscribers. Trent should be should have at least another zero at the end of his subscriber count. So I, I really hope folks will get out there and, and give, him, uh, give him a little love, a little recognition. Then we've got Spectacular Gadgets, checking out the OnePlus Watch. We've got Gadget Bite. I absolutely love the work that Gadget Byte has been doing, and they're building a gaming PC for under a thousand dollars in the year 2021. So uh, something tells me their ability to build a thousand dollar gaming PC is probably going to be better than certain other mega large tech outlets that tried to make a a gaming PC, an all out balls to the wall gaming PC. Uh, I don't know where my live strong bracelet is, but you know, you got to protect yourself against those static shocks. But gadget bite, I've learned so much about um, sort of the Indian market and sort of that Asian 
area um, of smartphones and carriers and 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 their their commentary is just so beautifully polished. I, I love what their channel does, and not surprising. I think they just broke three hundred and seventy thousand subscribers. So um, we also have some happy news. I know for a while we've been rounding up the subscriber count on glowing rectangles, but we are now properly over. 1,800 members, 1,807, 1,807, we're growing organically, and this is what makes me so excited, that this is becoming its own sort of healthy platform, so we really do need your participation, support, um, don't be stingy with the upvotes, if you come to drop a link and you want to share something, click some up arrows on your way out. Um, I, I know I said we were going to try and do something at a thousand, but that fell apart and I don't know that I can promise something for 2000, but we got to try and do something to celebrate whenever we hit these kind of like larger milestones for subscribers and for followers. It's just become such a, it, this is like one of my sanctuaries, you know, like I like to hang out in the subreddit because I find stuff here that I would never have found on YouTube and it's just getting broader and broader and more people are starting to share comments, sharing from the subreddit, supporting those content creators. It all means a lot to us when we see that active participation. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. It's a great little project. I'm so happy to see it kind of building its own momentum now. And uh, I hope you'll continue supporting it because it means a lot to folks when they see that their content's being shared. All right. <laughs> DT, no, Juan makes an only Juan's account when we hit 2,000. <laughs> Greg, everyone say boo, Greg. Greg is not subbed to glowing rectangles? Dang, Greg. I thought you was cool. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Get on it, Greg. <laughs> Gary the Fireman, I'll run shirtless down my block and post it on Twitter at 2000. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to hold you to that, but if that's what you want to do to celebrate, I'm, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> Access one TV. Damn, Greg, what are you doing? <laughs> the shining begins. <laughs> An absolutely appropriate comment from someone who has named their Twitch handle Mr. Malignance. <laughs> Uh, they cracked me up. All right, we do have a couple little gadget um, gadget stories that I want to knock out real quick, and then we can talk about this Xiaomi. We can spend the last like uh, twenty minutes or so talking about this Xiaomi. Um, the first one, this got so much sort of Apple ire. Like I said, I've been very positive on the philosophy of iPad Pro having an M1 chipset. Not because of what it can really do in this moment. We all know it's limited. Like iPad OS is holding us back. It's more, will we see developers get access to do this? But one of the things that needs to change was this story that broke. And uh, I caught it first on Apple Insider. Apple currently limiting M1 iPad Pro apps to five gigabytes of RAM each. Excuse me. So you've got 16 gigabytes of RAM in an iPad Pro but an app can only call five gigs. So uh, Procreate um, was getting a lot of ire on Twitter. It's a, um, a layer-based uh, content creation. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the, the, you make pretty things through Procreate. Um, they were getting some comments. People were calling them out on Twitter saying like, hey, why can't I do more layers? I've got this really awesome new iPad. You should be able to add all this extra stuff. And they flat out said, iPad OS is only letting us use this much RAM. So the reason why I want to bring this up now is because WWDC, I'm expecting to see some kind of commentary on iOS, um, uh, Apple Watch, or the Watch OS, and on iPad OS. And this is one of the things where, let's say you get an iPad with an M1, it's time to take the training wheels off. It's time to let developers really dig into this. I, I, it's frustrating because Apple gets all of this completely never contested media goodwill. Apple says they made the most powerful processor ever. Guess it's true. But we rarely see outlets or reviewers real world test 
these kinds of claims. So, you know, for the longest time, like I could show how an original iPhone SE or an iPhone 6S could could hang with and often outcompete my iPhone 10S for things like video rendering. So what was the point of buying this new, more powerful phone if this ridiculously old phone was just as fast? So Apple can make all these claims. It's the most powerful processor ever. But if they don't give you access to really use that power, what are you paying for? So I wanted to bring this one up specifically so that we can keep an eye out. I expect this is something they're going to they're going to show off in iPad OS. You know, not maybe not for older iPad Pros or if you're on an A series processor. No, 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 no. But if you're on an M1, well, now you can use all this more all this extra RAM. Hmm, maybe it's time for you to upgrade because Apple loves to point new features to their new products and leave their old products out in the cold even though this is largely the same software base. So that that's I just want us to keep an eye on that. I feel like this is going to be an announcement they make at WWDC. DTNL, it's got the bigger Geekbench score, Juan. Do you even tech, bro? I forget, was that the voice we were going to use for Aditya? Was he going to have the really bro voice? I, 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 somewhere in the back of my brain, I want to come up with like a voice for every single person who comments. So right now, I'd have to come up with 70 voices. <laughs> <laughs> and Arthur Lee just joined our glowing rectangles. Don't kill me. <laughs> mm. And Greg is on board too. So we've got two more users. We're almost up to 1810. What was that? 1809. We should be at 1809 unless someone dropped out. Uh, the other thing that I, I, I wanted to, um, to, to, to show real quick uh, because it's going to lead us into talking about the company uh, a little bit more. Um, oh, no. D did I lose? There was one other. Oh, dang. Hold on. I've got to get into the Discord. Let me do this one first. And, yeah, here it is. Okay, so this was from Android Headlines. I've got to move this over here. I'm sorry. I'm doing this all live. I'm, I'm real good at doing the YouTubes. I I'm even on YouTube. I'm real good at doing the Twitch. There we go. Uh, first Snapdragon 888 Plus details surface thanks to a benchmark. Um, written up by Christian Lusik, I think is how you would pronounce his name, over on AndroidHeadlines.com. Geekbench listing shares first Snapdragon 888 Plus details, um, and we get to see their scores, and they they look like scores that you would get from a properly cooled Snapdragon 888. So here's the deal. Um, I've been very critical of the 888 in phones. Um, I, I feel like the chip is so powerful and runs so hot, the manufacturer needs to, to work harder to build the phone around those thermals. And, and I don't believe we found a phone yet that doesn't have some kind of compromise to the experience. Either the phone runs scary hot, which would probably reduce the life of those components over time, or there's some kind of CPU throttle like Samsung employs, or there's some kind of GPU limit like OnePlus employs. No one is escaping this. So it's completely disingenuous to criticize one company, one manufacturer. Oh, uh, OnePlus phones, uh, they're capped. It's frame rate capped. When everything CPU bound grossly outperforms the Samsung because Samsungs are CPU throttled. So my concerns on the A88 are more, how do we extract this power and how do we look at sustained use? Because a lot of consumers are going to use their phones for longer than a Geekbench score. If it's gaming, if it's you know video streaming or video calling or maybe editing a TikTok. You know, there are all these different applications that real people use that techies can't wrap their brain around. Like, oh, but I ran a Geekbench score. That's all I use my phone for. Uh, I just benchmark my phone all day. That's all I do with my phone is I use 5G and I benchmark. Um, the A88 is more powerful than the 865, but we've got to be a bit more selective about what applications really see the benefit 
from that. You know, I was just complaining about Apple. You know, like a, a new phone won't really outperform an old phone because Apple kind of limits the feel and the the performance of iOS to a certain tier, and then it kind of keeps all of their devices at that tier. Um, here, we've got kind of the opposite problem. There are some times where a phone might be able to spike performance, but then it's running too hot, and so then that performance crashes, and it's slower than an older phone would be. So my concerns on the A88 are, are nuanced. It's now... Who's doing a better job of building the phone around these thermals to really kind of maximize that consumer experience, that the, the consumer benefits? And it's tricky. I mean, it's it's like test by test. One phone is going to do better for this app. Another phone is going to do better for this app. We cannot find, through Geekbench scores, a way to predict what phone will do what tasks better. So we're really like, it's it's super specific. Benefit here, drawback here, benefit there, equal to an older phone. So immediately when this story came out, I saw a bunch of folks going like, well, wait a minute. Why is why is Qualcomm making a whole new processor when the A88 is already having some issues with thermals? And that's not really what the pluses are. We kind of did this with the 865 and the 865 plus, and now we're doing it again with the 870. The 870 is an 865 plus plus, but Qualcomm isn't making a new chip. It's not like, you know, they've got these this box of parts and that you put all the parts together and that's an 865. Well, we're going to make an 865 plus. We've got to come up with a whole new box of parts. This is why I would very highly recommend, again, following Tech Tech Potato and uh, Gary Explains. Get those two guys together. We need to get those two guys into some regular live streams because I'd love to see some of those conversations. Um, but what happens is Qualcomm makes an 865. And over time, the process for manufacturing that 865 gets better and better and better. And as they go through that development process of fabricating that chip, they start to see some of them been better. And that means they can be driven to a higher limit or a higher threshold. The manufacturing process typically isn't different, but that 865 can perform at a higher tier because of just the, the purity of the fabrication process. So the 888 plus that's going to be coming out is a way for Qualcomm to make a little bit more money on this fabrication. They, they, they have to spend billions a year retooling for each new generation of chipset and SOC that they make. So as they go through the batch of making that chip, the process gets better refined. And so now in the second half of the, half of the year to recoup some of that additional investment from tooling up to make the A88, they're going to have a line of A88s that perform better. When we get to the A88 and we really physically, in real life, put it into a phone, I don't expect the performance to be much different than what we can currently get out of an A88. Just because when you run the chip at a higher tier, it's probably just going to throttle sooner. And that's kind of what I saw with the 870. It really, when we talk about sustained use, it really wasn't better than the best 865s that I've gotten my hands on. I kind of feel like it's going to be the same way here. But it's good for marketing. It, it helps them uh, differentiate price tiers. So they, they can say, we're going to put a, a box of these 888s we're going to put a bunch of these really high-performing, high-bend, high-tier A88s in a box. We know these are the goodest chips. If you want them, they cost more because we went through this certification process. If you don't want the best bend A88s, we still sell the rest of the A88s that perform within a certain window of tolerances. And I'm sure they probably also have a box of lower bend A88s too. You know, again, I'm sure they have relationships with their manufacturing customers where they can kind of pick and choose as they go. So that's really all this is. 
um, Mr. Malignant's. The 888 plus stands for 888 plus cooling. <laughs> And Greg, that's that's all this plus means. And the 865 plus to the 870, this 888 plus, you 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 refine your manufacture, you refine your fabricating so that you can get to a point where you can better better set aside chips that perform above and beyond your your normal expectations. But then it's going to be up to the manufacturers to extract that power. If you are not putting in um, the hardware to properly cool, to mitigate thermals, to manage your battery, your power management. If you're not going through that benefit, I mean, if you're not going through your due diligence, there will be no benefit to an A88 plus. And so I really feel like A88 plus might be, might be the purview of gaming phones where it makes the most sense, where it's okay if the phone's a little chunkier, maybe it's got like active cooling, like a red magic that makes more sense. You can, you can really kind of focus in on that demographic. I'll, I'll be shocked. I'll be shocked if that chip ends up in a fragile folding phone. Like if, if that's what they use for a, a, a Z Fold 3. Like I don't think that's going to be the right fit. And again, I think Samsung's going to look at ways to cut costs in the future, not put in more expensive components than they need to. From Doomer, what will be the 870 of the 888? Will it be the 890 or the 889? <laughs> I'm so frustrated by um, Qualcomm's naming convention here. Because it used to be, you know, like, it was the 820 and then we got the 825. And I thought that made beautiful sense. If you, you start out with, like, the 820 is the first iteration of that. And then you could go, like, eight, oh, it was 820 and 821. Sorry, excuse me. Um that's that's brilliant just imagine like if we had done 860 then the 860 plus could have been the 861 and then the 860 plus plus could have been the 865 you know like just numbers i feel is so much easier than all of these different like numbers and pluses and letters and variants and generations and it, I, I feel it's so much more complicated than it needs to be and also like why go to fives if each one is sort of its own generation, you know, like the 830 was its own generational product. No, we got to call it the 835. Why? <laughs> Why not call it the 830? I hate names on tech products. It's so confusing. Um, so lastly, in terms of uh, things that are hot that might be scary, um, Xiaomi. Uh, yesterday put out a video showing their hypercharge a uh, 200 watt wired charging 120 watt wireless charging so on my oneplus 9 pro video um, and on my black shark video i've increasingly been talking about phone chargers uh, because I've been heavily influenced by Sony. I, I honestly don't have my Xperia on the table right now. That's shocking. I, on an expensive phone, I appreciate having the option. I don't feel like that's the option you should always use. So just because you can charge up a Black Shark like from zero to 100% in like, 14 minutes i don't feel like that's the way you should always be topping off your phone but it makes a ton of sense for someone who might really be into gaming i'm in the middle of this game i don't want to put it down for long i'm getting a low battery warning pop in a cable set the phone down go take a five minute break and come back and you'll have hours of playtime after that <laughs> from access one tv uh so at what percentage does the phone just explode <laughs> so i have to imagine that this is a a sort of split cell battery technology where you've got two batteries that are both individually charged at 100 watts the black shark at 120 watts ran warm um 
it, it tops off crazy fast, but I would highly recommend against using your phone actively while it's plugged in to charge under these new crazy fast charging regimens. And, and I'm extending that from to like the old dash and warp charging. If you're charging over 30 watts, set your phone down, just let it top off. The, the, the double whammy of using the phone while you're running it hot to me seems like a surefire way to radically reduce the overall life of that product where you're just going to be burning that battery out. It's going to be degrading much faster. We won't have data on this until those phones are, are re long retired. Like for us to get a good handle on the demographics and, and the trends of using these products, we got to use them for more than a year. And so by the time we say like, oh, hey, like we've been studying these 45 watt, 65 watt chargers, we'll, we'll have been through two years of 200 watt charging. It, it, it's so, it, the, the tech moves so much faster than our ability to study what really happens to these products over time. And you know, a one year sampling of how phones age and degrade really isn't indicative of what the real lifestyle implications are when someone might want to try and hold on to that phone for three years. But then we can't tell them, oh, hey, yeah, that fast charging you've got is going to burn your phone out in two years. We need, we need to move the studies and the windows around. <laughs> Access One TV. Um, I, you know, this might be a good point. I honestly don't know. Uh, two batteries charging at 100 watts to get 200 watts versus two batteries charging at 60 watts to get 120. Surely they have three cells. There's no way 100 watt charging per battery is going to be good for safety and battery longevity. I don't know. I honestly think it might be two cells at 100, but you're right. It could be three cells at like 65. I, I don't know. I honestly don't. That That's a very good point, though, that you bring up. But regardless... Two cells at, a, at, at 60 watts a piece to get 120 watt charging runs pretty warm. And, and, and Lolly DK 1001, I wish more phones would implement Sony's battery care options, which, excuse me, Sony has completely won me over with their methods of battery care, HS power control. It's the right play. If, if you're telling me that someone wants to try and hold on to a phone for more than two years, they need those kinds of features. They need those kinds of options. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm crazy curious because the thing is, if you have 200 watt wire charging, that's great in a pinch. I literally am down to five minutes that I'll have time to charge this phone. Let me use my ridiculously crazy fast charger just so I can get on with my day. And then when I wanna top off my phone throughout the day or I wanna charge overnight, I can go and buy a less expensive, slower charger. You know, like some like 15 watt charger, two amp. Remember when we went to two amps and we're like, whoa, we can charge a phone in under a day. <laughs> but I really need that to be a, a bigger part of the conversation. I, I need more consumers to sort of understand this is the, the emergency top-off charger, not the charger I leave my phone connected to all day. That's a bad idea. So uh, what's a good idea is taking a look at the Xiaomi Mi 11i. Can anyone, can anyone tell me, what is the, the Redmi version of this? Is it the, the K40? Is that, is that what this phone is? Um, so this is the Mi 11i. This is Xiaomi's sort of uh, little little brother to the Mi 11. It too has a 108 megapixel camera sensor on the back, but lower megapixel, it's an eight megapixel ultra wide and a five megapixel uh, um, macro, macro sensor. A 1080p display with 120 hertz. Um, oh, and, and I always have to point these out. Now alongside Sony, the Mi series phones, the Mi 11s, have some of my favorite fingerprint sensors. Uh, from the Mi 11 Lite to this one, this power button sensor is wonderful. 
it, it is easily one of the most responsive um, unlock methods I've used on a current phone. I, I It makes me so sad whenever I have to go back to in-display fingerprint sensors. I don't like them. I don't. I don't like in-display when power button. Oh, this works so well. I can do this all day. I haven't faulted once. I mean, just think about like, this is so silly. I mean, again, in the way that techies review products, like, oh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm using my phone. You know, like no one unlocks and locks their phone. Like I am doing this right now. But that kind of tra transfers, that, that kind of adds to that. I'm out and about and I pull my phone out of my pocket and I'm trying to do something or reference it quickly. And I'm doing the thing where I try and move my thumb to anticipate where the fingerprint sensor might be because it's a surfaceless, totally smooth piece of glass. And I try and tap onto it and like, like you've got to put your, you've got to stop paying attention to something else. And I don't mean to pick on OnePlus here, but again, especially now that the OnePlus 9 Pro's fingerprint sensor is mounted lower, you know, to get it, it's like I've got to kind of wake the phone up and then look at it and, and make an effort to tell the phone to unlock. Where pulling this Mi 11 out of my pocket, just like my Xperia, my Xperia 1 Mark II or the, um, the Mi 11 Lite, as I'm pulling the phone out of my pocket, where my thumb naturally lands up just unlocks the phone. And, and I miss that as a feature. I miss that as a consideration because that is more organic. It's more readily accessible. The phone blends into the background of your day. It's not, oh, wait. You know, you, you see like the old lady at the supermarket. Hold on, let me take out my phone. And now let me unlock it. Oh, wait, it didn't do it. Let me do it again. Okay, now it's unlocked and now I can do things. And it's like, she's holding up the whole line. <laughs> like that's everything I've, I feel every time I get a misfire on an in-display fingerprint sensor, that's what I feel like. Oh, you're right, phone. I didn't perfectly align my thumb to a screen sensor that I can't feel on a smooth piece of glass. So let me stop everything else that I'm paying attention to right now just to focus on turning you on. And I don't have to do that with a power button fingerprint sensor. So I'm, I'm still, I, I've done a weekend with the Mi 11. I'm still very shaky on uh, Xiaomi software. Um, I've, I've worked better on setting up this phone to not be signed in to all of the Xiaomi services and all of like not firing up the individual uh, pre-installed like Xiaomi games and, and apps still really bothers me that I get, hold on, I don't think I've turned it on. So let me see on the calculator. Like that kind of bugs when you try to use the Xiaomi calculator and it, you know, welcome to the calculator app. Uh, this app contains the following features, basic calculator, scientific calculator, and calculating templates for loans, investments, EMI, and more. The calculator needs to collect necessary personal information to provide you with basic services. You can learn how we handle the information we collect in our privacy policy. And your only options are to agree or disagree. And if you don't agree, then you can't use the calculator on your phone. And I have not agreed. So the, 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 the way that Xiaomi presents some of these value-added services and value-added games makes me a little twitchy. I, I, I want the presentation of Xiaomi software to not be like that on something like a calculator. If it if it's the browser, I understand the sort of long storied relationship with Xiaomi and their consumers with how browsers work on on me phones. If it's something like a mail app, you know, again, I'm I'm using Spark right now just to manage my some gadget guy email, and it's been working really well. But I understand that that's kind of a separate third party service. It's an app of a service that helps you manage your email. Makes sense to me. I know what I'm signing up for there. For a calculator, I just don't feel like calculator is the thing. 
So um, I, I, outside of that, though, what has been just absolutely terrific, this is a wonderfully strong competitor in that iPhone 12 to OnePlus 9 Galaxy S21 lowest level of a premium tier product. You know, again, we're, we're crossing over. This, this is existing at the uh, boundary, the boundary waters of a mid-ranger phone and a premium tier device. Neck and neck. I mean, there's so much comp- good competition here happening against a phone like a OnePlus 9. And I am going to be making a video pitting these two up against each other because techies are awful at sort of rationally discussing things like camera differences. Because, you know, think about how many people you've seen like, oh, OnePlus 9, pff, this doesn't even have like OIS on the camera. <laughs> I mean, like even my Nord has OIS on the camera. And then I've been looking up, you know, the Mi 11 and the, the Redmi variant on this. And it's just all of this glowing. This is a nearly perfect phone. Xiaomi does it again. And the thing is, it's not like I'm trying to take anything away from Xiaomi. It's that for some reason, we're punching down on OnePlus now. I don't know if you all got the memo, the memo but now this, is, this phone is not okay. And this phone is okay. So this phone is doing things the goodest. And this phone is a tragic failure. These, these two experiences are so similar. I love watching this kind of competition play out because they're offering things that at a 600 to $700 tier, Samsung and Apple could learn some things from. Like the main camera sensor on the Mi 11i is formidable. Oh, but it doesn't have OIS. That means you're a terrible photographer. If you can't get good photos out of a OnePlus 9 or a Mi 11i, that means you're really bad. I mean, really bad at doing photography stuff. They're effortlessly good shooters. Again, I I had both while I was taking my daughter out to that Ikea and that open air mall. The photos are great. They're stunning. I think Xiaomi's HDR processing is leaning a little too bright, and I like the contrastier look of OnePlus uh, post-processing better, but they're gorgeous. They're neck and neck. And it's fun kind of pitting those differences against each other. Like, you know, I like the fingerprint sensor better on the, the Mi 11. I really miss having the notification rocker switch on my OnePlus phones. Two little different hardware bits, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I like having, you know, the ability to actively toggle notifications and stuff. And I like a tactile switch for that. But I unlock my phone way more than I toggle my notifications. Uh, I love it. I love a good fight. And this also had the uh, the headphone dongle. Do I have it? Yeah, it's over here. So the Mi 11i also came with this this little headphone dongle. <laughs> Like in the box. I was like, oh, that's cute. You've, you've remembered that even at 700 ish dollars, someone might have a pair of earbuds or headphones that they would just want to plug into the phone. Well played, Mi 11. And they included the case in the box. You know, again, nicely fleshed out, nicely laid out. I think that's that's a good a good combo of benefits. So Snapdragon 888, all all of the specs. You can read up on the specs. You don't need me to read the specs off at you. And 30 watt fast charging. Um, uh, increasingly, and again, because I, I definitely am more of a team Android kind of person, at, a, at around this upper mid-ranger, lower end premium, which I need, because I hate that. Oh, it's a premium mid-ranger. Shut up. I hate confusing no stupid tiers somewhere around seven hundred dollars this tier of android is getting so phenomenally good the big batteries the fast charging the high refresh rate displays the the humongous camera sensors i I don't know if i'll be able to show this i don't think my panasonic is going to focus on this right but i'm taking the case off and you've got like a double decker sandwich stack 
of camera module. So you've got like the main camera module where they've got the flash and I think one of the sensors for the for the autofocus. And then above that is the big depth for what you need on a larger main camera sensor. And then they've just matched the depth for the ultra wide and the macro sensor. I want you to think about all those people that, especially all the techies, like like the Verge. I'm going to call out the Verge. What do you think about all those all those folks who were panning a $700 Pixel Five? It's got a tiny camera sensor. We're reviewing a Galaxy S21 Ultra, and we're pitting it against an iPhone 12 Pro Max because they have bigger camera sensors. We're going out of our way to talk trash about the Pixel 5 and their smaller camera sensor. Well, that's the camera sensor that you'd get on an iPhone 12 Pro and on an iPhone 12. So at around the same price point, that is way smaller than the camera sensor you're gonna get on this Mi 11. So what are we doing? <laughs> what are we complaining about? Where are, why is it okay for Apple to start charging in the high 700s, low 800s, um, especially once you factor in accessories like a charging brick, you know, a, a headphone dongle, <laughs> things like that. You get a bumper case for it, um, all that. But that's, that's the right way to spend over $800. And when then we pick up a OnePlus 9, and it, well, it's just not good enough. It were, if it were gooder, I would buy one. But it's just not good enough for the monies. It's just so obnoxiously rigged. So, um, a short story, incredibly long. I have really been enjoying the overall hardware experience here. I was playing Dead Cells. I think it's firing up at 120. So 120 hertz for Dead Cells looks beautiful. Uh, it does run warm, especially when I was uh, when I was setting this phone up. I I, uh, I I was running around like crazy. So one of our cars, the air conditioning's busted, and I was having to drive back and forth from our old place to our new place, just like dumping off, uh, dropping off boxes and 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 packing up uh, our car trunk to get cleaning supplies out. Along the way, a lot of the setup for this phone was done over 5G, and I would pick the phone up and plugged into my car charger, which I think is just a, a like a 15 watt charger. Oh man, this phone was toasty. Um, it was real warm. Um, and I had to unplug it, let it kind of cool off. I'd like pausing on updating apps and then kind of get back into it. Um, but yeah, it was it was it making me a little anxious. Like I feel like Xiaomi is letting the thermals run hotter just so that the perceived performance of the phone doesn't feel like it's tanking like it does on a Galaxy. Um, but uh it was definitely like we were talking about like the Xiaomi hypercharging and then also like the 888, the, the, the Qualcomm 888 plus or a few concerns there. But overall, like this is an incredible tier of smartphone that gets us back to what the high end used to be. Remember, high end phone pricing used to be around six to seven hundred dollars. And we thought that that was just such an extravagance. You know, um, you know, back in the one plus, uh, the the HTC One days, you know, getting an iPhone six. Oh man, an iPhone six. That's gonna be like a like a seven hundred dollar phone if you bump up the storage. Now we've been trying to push this notion of thousand dollar plus devices, and while I still do feel like there's an argument to be made for like a One Plus Nine Pro or a Galaxy S twenty one Ultra. Increasingly, those should be discussed as the ultra premium niche territory. They should not be the de facto standard consumer conversation. I feel that should top out at around $700. Just like nice phones have always kind of topped out around $700. This phone makes so much sense around $700. <laughs> I, 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 it, there, there's this major disconnect in how we talk about phones. The Verge helped me spell this out beautifully. We took a $700 Pixel 5 and refused to compare the performance of its camera 
against phones that retail for over $1,200. So they have a $500 advantage over this Pixel 5, and we can't show you how their cameras really do perform better. We're just gonna tell you it wasn't worth testing the Pixel 5 against a $1,200 Samsung and a $1,200 iPhone. You'll just have to take our word on it because if it were really that easy to show you those differences, we could have shown you those differences, but it's not. <laughs> it's really not that easy. And uh, I feel like this game is rigged. <laughs> yeah, Kyle Ruggles. Remember we were talking about phones breaking the $1,000 barrier. Now it's like three years later and we're way past that. <laughs> DT Anil, if you don't take out a second mortgage from your for your phone, you don't tech right. Stay away from me, peasant. Yeah, just don't be poor. I mean, do you even speak wealth, bro? Just don't be broke. I don't speak broke. I have an iPhone. Uh, Gabaletta, this is why I use phone vent mounts in my car in Southern Florida in the summer. It gets hot. Charging your phone in your car will nuke your device. Having the phone on the AC vent helps it keep cool while charging. Okay, Gavilette, I'm going to do you one better because, I mean, California, we don't get as humid. So the heat index, I feel like Florida regularly beats us, but we're still getting pretty toasty. We're expecting it to hit like 110 degrees this summer here uh, out in the burbs. Um, not only do I'm, I'm right there with you. I've moved to a, a vent mount so that one of my phone is always blocking one of my AC vents. I now don't charge my phone in my car while I'm using it on that vent mount. It is just so much heat radiating off of the windshield of my car that I am trying as hard as I can to never contribute to the heat of the device. And it's got the AC vent for active cooling. I mean, again, it's like, I, I, I am so anxious <laughs> about how these products are really used. Um, it, it, I feel like we need a new generation of consumer education on like what the reality of a pocket supercomputer really resembles. Um, from Goran, Goran Petrovic, one more thing about the Zenfone 8. It has amazing speakers and quality terms is possibly the best on the market. Loudness, the same as the S21 Ultra, but better quality. It's amazing how Asus did this. I really need to get my hands on some Asus this year. I have not kept up I, I think the last phone i spent any time with was the rog2 I, I mean especially now that they they brought the headphone back, jack back too i i really need to try and play better but i feel like it wasn't it just announced like we only just recently got north american shipping for like property like you could buy uh the rog directly through asus like you didn't have to go through ebay or some other reseller to get it I want to say like that just happened. So I'll maybe see if there's not a way for me to, to get my hands on one for a quick test drive. <laughs> Arthur Lee, just don't be poor. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> oh, it's funny. <laughs> oh, access one. You remember when I sent you the ROG two, you want to play with the ROG five? Um, so here's, here's the deal. Um, I am not taking, so a few, a few reviewer friends, like we'll trade phones back and forth. Um, I sent my one plus nine out to Barry, uh, Barry Johnson. Please go check out his video. His style is so rad. And I think his one plus nine video only has like 300 views on it, which is criminal. Like it deserves so much more attention. Um, but I'm, I'm really not playing anymore. Like someone offered to send me their Z fold too. And I was like, that's your personal phone. I can't. It's like every single time someone sends me a phone just to kind of like loan out, something happens with shipping or the product gets damaged in transit or it just disappears. I know, like when I sent that ROG back, it was gone for like two weeks. I, it's it's such a mess. It's such a headache. I mean, I always appreciate people making the offer, but I, I absolutely can't. It, it hurts my soul to think like, you actually bought this phone for your use and you want me to borrow it just to kind of do some coverage on it. If I can't get it safely and get it back to you safely, like 
You can't meet me at the Galleria and, and hand the phone off to me <laughs> to do a drop off. Like, I don't think um, I, I can take you up on that offer anymore. And everyone say goodnight to Heiki. Heiki's going to bed. I have to wake up early tomorrow and I'm feeling sleepy. Thanks for the show and have a nice week, everybody. Have a great night, Heiki, and thanks for dropping by. Actually, that's we're, we're over our two hours, so I think that's the point where we should start wrapping this up. Um, be, be, be on the lookout. I'm going to have a lot more to say about the Mi 11i. I, I've been very impressed with where Xiaomi has been taking their hardware. And it was a story that we didn't cover this week, but if you catch the, the Xiaomi PR... Um, like their, their, their website for press releases. I believe they have finally been totally cleared and removed from the United States entities list. Um, that was a story we were following for a while. So I, I kind of think that Xiaomi's next stage is going to be looking at what other inroads they might have for North American distribution. Now that they're no longer considered uh, an entity of the Chinese government from the U.S. government, um, that might give them some opportunities to reach out to uh, MVNOs, to carriers, or, or even just to like, um, uh, you know, like a Best Buy, you know, where Huawei was trying to make some inroads in North America with the Mate 10. I feel like Xiaomi is building towards expansion. I don't have any data on that. This is just my guess. I don't have any, any inside insight. Um, but this to me seems like it's the right time. And it would be nice to get some additional competition, especially when... Uh, this hardware has been so good. Um, we definitely have to have a conversation about software, um, but it, it's been really interesting seeing this brand approach a mid-ranger and premium tier at the same time. And I feel like they're deserving of the accolades that they've been getting. And now we've got a competitive uh, manufacturer in this space. It'd be nice if we could get direct consumer access in North America. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and, uh, and put a pin in this. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. Folks, thank you so much for joining me on like my first real show in like two weeks. <laughs> like I'm, I'm finally outside the, the horrors of trying to pack up one place and, and the exhaustion of trying to unpack another place. And I'm, I'm feeling like this week I'm going to be getting back on track some actual video production. I've got another speaker and audio deep dive coming out for the Black Shark. I've got that editorial that I'm gonna be putting out on headphones. And then I'm trying to add to some of the camera commentary. Um, I, I'm gonna to put together a video. Uh, it's gonna take me a little longer just because I need nicer shots than what I normally do for my B-roll. But talking about how we can move a camera to create content um, in, in ways that like, we, we take for granted those kinds of conversations when we're dealing with traditional, like mirrorless DSLRs, you know, uh, cinema style cameras. I feel like a part of that conversation should, should now be happening with our phones because there are some dead giveaways for how you move a phone through a shot that make it look like phone footage. But if you use some of the tricks that we normally use for standalone cameras, I think it significantly improves the quality of your output. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm playing around with with a with a way to do that, how to move a camera, or how to move a phone camera to create better content. So so we're we're um we're gonna play. I, I think this is gonna be fun, and I think this is gonna be uh, some some interesting content, getting us away from just phone review after phone review after phone review. Let's focus on actually using these things, and and getting more of our money's worth. So uh, just like I started this, I, I, um, well, first of all, I do want to thank this week's sponsor, Frameit. I forgot to thank them last week at the end of my show. Uh, it was very bad on me. Uh, they're sponsoring this, and they're helping to bring uh, this content to you all fine uh, folks out there. Definitely check it out, frameitapp.com. It is a really fun way to edit video. So it's not just me walking around my pool at the beginning of this podcast. That genuinely one of the best ways I've ever seen to keyframe uh, video footage on our phones and and you can craft content around it really easily so frameitapp.com i want to thank them for supporting the production on this podcast and just like i said at the top of this video um i hope everyone out there is having a phenomenal weekend and those of us here in the united states if uh you can take a minute just to just to think to to remember to um, consider the men and women that have protected our country 
that have contributed to our safety and security and, and have been been a part of our community. You know, we, we also kind of forget like the influence and the impact that they have when they're here at home being a part of the fabric of America. And uh, hopefully you're able to take that minute to, to think and consider and remember while you're also eating some bomb food, you <laughs> know, some, something real tasty, something real good. I hope, I hope you're getting, I hope you're getting to enjoy uh, the benefits of their, per, uh, of their, um, contributions to our society. Um, like I said, I'm doing brats. So uh, I, I hope you will enjoy something equally as uh, delicious and uh, probably not as good for your waistline. So folks, um, I want you to have an amazing week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And I'll catch you all back here for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SDGQA podcast channel. Be well. Take care. Happy Memorial Day. I'll catch you back here next week. I love you all.